Uh, good afternoon and thanks for joining us this afternoon for this important discussion about uh, one of Australia's crucial sectors of the economy, the aviation sector. Uh, I'd like to begin by briefly acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we all meet across this country um, and uh, pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days to, to join us for this uh, conversation discussion. Uh, especially our speakers who are, who are here uh, on the screen as well. I'd like to also thank TWU Super uh, for sponsoring this work. Uh, Frank Sandy, their CEO, and, and Matthew Rocks uh, for recognising uh, the, the, one of the biggest external risks to their members' uh, retirement incomes uh, if they work in aviation is very much the predicament that many uh, of their workers face right now. Uh, many have been being stood down, uh, who aren't getting super contributions, particularly uh, staff at uh, Donata that have been cut out, cut out of the JobKeeper program. Um, and also if you're an aviation worker who uh, might lose your job through you know, the downturn that, that we're all expecting and facing, you're not just facing time out of the workforce, but the likelihood that the next job won't, may not necessarily be as productive in the short term as the one you're currently in. And therefore, the prospects that your pay and super might diminish. So therefore, it's really important uh, from just from a retirement incomes perspective that super funds take an interest in what they can do to preserve the jobs that their members currently have. If I can briefly touch on the report before introducing our speakers, uh, the, the starting port, uh, point for this report uh, was that as the events unfolded, uh, governments needed to respond quickly and without complete information about what was going on. And so we couldn't expect them to get every detail 100% right. Uncertainty still remains, uh, but there should be less cause for surprise now. And so the contribution we wanted to make was to inject uh, some additional rigour into the policy making process, as well as consistency into the into uh, into what is, it, what is essential for a sustainable private sector led outcome to the one we're currently in. So this report seeks to achieve this uh, via four, by providing four overarching principles uh, that are predominantly based around government statements that ministers have made over the, over the, uh, the recent few months. These include uh, principles such as economic sovereignty, protecting taxpayer interests, a competitive neutrality and a market led solution. And this is as much about the short term survival and protecting existing businesses and jobs as it is about the long term performance and sustainability of this enabling sector. And this is the one point I wanted to make about the content of the re report before I introduce our guest speakers. There's, there's very much a cliche even to observe that airlines are so vulnerable to external shocks that you'd be a fool to own shares in them. And that's why many people put to me even that government shouldn't uh, one of the reasons why government shouldn't have stakes in airlines. Well, if we believe that about ownership, one of the questions I want to put to, to the panel when we get to the discussion is, well, what are we saying about the labour or human capital component? Uh, you know, are we, are we going to get the service and performance outcomes we need if we're sending a signal to the workforce that you're, you're going to be joining a precarious uh, industry every time, you know, there's a, there's a downturn like the one we've seen or the GFC, your jobs, you know, might be at a heightened level of risk than other industries. Remembering that this is an industry where safety matters above everything else, and notwithstanding the benefits of having an effective safety regulator and policies, at the end of the day, it is the people flying our planes and screening our luggage that keep us safe. So with that small indulgence, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our panel, uh, which covers a great cross-section of industry political and, and workforce perspectives. Our first speaker today is uh, the Honourable Paul Lucas. Paul was Transport Minister under Peter Beattie and Deputy Premier to Anna Bly. Naturally, the size of Queensland's geography means aviation figures differently in its state politics. And, uh, you know, the focus of intrastate aviation is, uh, is an important one in Paul's former portfolio. Paul also brings to this discussion his time as Director of Air Services Australia. So thank you, Paul, for being with us today and over to you to, to address the audience. Thanks very much, James. Well, I just thought I'd make a few preliminary points. Um, first of all, 
clearly the very fact that we're speaking in the way that we are illustrates that we're on an, in unprecedented times. And unprecedented times have had impacts that have been, of course, very significant but also required governments and policymakers to make decisions that simply would not even washed with the community um, six months ago. And we're now facing a situation, for example, in our aviation sector, where we're potentially going to lose a provider of 40% of the uh, aviation domestic services in this country. And of course, also all of the jobs that, that fall behind that and of course, all of the industries and other sectors, and Margie's here representing a number of sectors, including tourism, that will be impacted upon that. So what's changed is that I think even now that the role of government has changed for a long, long time in the future. Uh, government taking hands off attitudes uh, to important policy issues doesn't work. And uh, so what we need to talk about is what is the role of government, what is appropriate for it, making sure that it's not risking taxpayer dollars unnecessarily, but on the other hand, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So this is an industry that facilitates so many other industries. Uh, it is a future industry, certainly not a sunset industry, and it is a major employer. And frankly, you know, you talk about aviation, the Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Brisbane, uh, Brisbane, Melbourne city pairs are amongst the most busiest in the world. So uh, it is a quite an, it is an efficient industry, a high quality industry, and a safe industry. We need to make it better as a result of COVID nineteen, not worse for the public uh, in particular, but also those who work in it. Thank you, Paul, for those opening remarks. Uh, our next speaker is Margie Osmond. Uh, Margie is the CEO of the Tourism and Transport Forum. As Paul uh, alluded to, uh, Margie's membership spans not just those directly impacted uh, within the aviation sector, but accommodation and tourism operators. And so the, really the full span of the, the sorts of businesses and firms that we're talking about, uh, you know, who, for whom aviation is important. Um, so Margie's perspective is necessarily comprehensive and larger than any one interest or in commercial interest. On top of this, Margie brings considerable experience from a variety of leadership roles across uh, various peak bodies and associations. So it's my great pleasure now to, to thank Margie for joining us and uh, give her insights and remarks on the short and long-term challenges uh, facing aviation. Thank you very much, James. Uh, look, I think probably the, the place to start is that if there's any good news to be had out of the current situation, the tourism industry has never had the profile it currently has, and it has never had the sort of attention from them. However, the industry is on its knees. Um, we've gone through peripherally, I suppose, uh, the process of the drought, then of course the bushfires, which were tragic and appalling, and now COVID, and then on top of that, a growing level of uncertainty about when domestic borders will or won't open all of which obviously impacts on the aviation industry. Uh, Australia is a long haul destination. Our inbound tourism market works because we have a great aviation industry. Our domestic tourism needs that same aviation industry to be able to function uh, you know, at its top level. While I think it's pretty clear that in the short term, we're gonna see a massive resurgence of domestic tourism because people won't have a choice. Uh, we're also seeing people get back in their cars. So there's going to be a job to be done here in terms of restoring consumer confidence in the aviation industry, not just the issues around its mechanics. Uh, and that I think is a bit of a sleeper in this conversation. We've recently done some fairly serious consumer work, um, which tells us that people think that trains are safer from a COVID perspective than airplanes, but airplanes are safer than buses. Uh, but the safest environment for everybody is their own car. So in terms of rebuilding that confidence in aviation, it's not going to be just as simple as how much of a subsidy government might choose to make or how we reform and reshape the industry. I suppose the most critical issue beyond what might be happening uh, from a domestic point of view with borders, we um, are part of the Australian New Zealand Leadership Forum. I co-chair the Safe Borders Group, which is looking at the operational outcome. How can we make the Trans-Tasman bubble work? What needs to happen? Uh, from our point of view, that's um, getting that right uh, 
means that we can then uh, hopefully seamlessly apply that to other countries that have similar uh, disease management systems that therefore might be considered as partners in that bubble. So potentially in the Pacific, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, some of these sorts of places. And critical to that process is no need for a two week isolation, which is one of the reasons why it needs to be a very carefully considered process by government across the board. But what is important about that is that it is part of restoring confidence in the aviation industry and getting people keen to fly again. Our research is showing us that something like 42% of people want to travel overseas and the number one destination they want to go to is in fact New Zealand by a very long shot. Uh, Singapore comes in at number two at a lot smaller number. I think really the other big change that's going to happen within the aviation industry um, beyond what the shape, the feel, the level of government support, the number of players in the marketplace is going to look like, is the change in the level of responsibility that will accrue to travellers. And that's important not just for other travellers, but it's also important for those people who work within the industry. One of the most critical parts of the discussion about the Trans-Tasman is understanding if you're not well or you're waiting for a COVID result or whatever else it might be, that sniffle that just won't go away, uh, don't fly, don't go to the airport. That's your responsibility as a traveller. And at the other end of the spectrum, the industry has to make itself as flexible as possible in terms of people's capacity to change their arrangements. Um, and there's a whole range of more or less complex issues that accrue to opening the Trans-Tasman. But it's the first step in, if you like, restoring that confidence issue and hopefully taking us out to a wider market which is important not just for the tourism industry, but very much for the agricultural and manufacturing sectors. Because as anyone involved in the industry can tell you, it's almost more important what goes in the guts of a plane than who's sitting in the plane upstairs. So I, I think probably, James, I'd, I'd finish it there. Great. Thank you, Margaret. It's uh, very you know, interesting for us to hear directly from someone who's really involved with their members in kickstarting the economy and the, and the challenges in that. Another person who I guess is very much doing the same sort of thing for his members is our next speaker, uh, which is Michael Kane. Michael Kane is the National Secretary of the Transport Workers Union and so very much involved in the, uh, in the conversations with a variety of workforces that are, you know, I guess, facing tougher times right now, including Virgin, but also Donata and others. And so it's, uh, it's great for us to have Michael, who's taken some time out of that work to be able to join us today. And, Michael, over to you to, for your contribution in the, in the opening remarks. Oh, thanks, um, thanks, James, and uh, thanks for those comments too. Really good counsel there already from uh, from Margie and Paul. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to to talk today. Um, it is a really intense time in aviation, and I thought I'd start just with a couple of quotes just to just to get us um, all refocused on some of the um, terrible human factors involved here um, beyond the virus. Uh, going into our workforces and you know I've got a couple of quotes here one from a virgin worker excuse me while I turn and read um, uh, I live alone and I feel vulnerable I keep thinking of all the bills that will come if I won't be able to pay and, and what I'm going to do if I won't be able to pay if virgin goes under another one that's been stressful and struggling to pay rent I've got no money for food I pay full price for my medication I've got diabetes and a heart condition I'm living in fear um, and this is the type of atmosphere that we're holding this uh, forum in. And I'll make three uh, general um, uh, points uh, in opening, James. The first is that really the aviation industry's got to return to core business and get that right. I mean, as a basic premise, we've already heard from, uh, from Margie and Paul, it's a sparsely populated island nation. Uh, we rely on aviation quite obviously to connect us with the rest of the world and for our um, domestic economy, our national security, our public health, our vital supply chains uh, all depend on it. And as Margie said, one of our biggest in industries, tourism, is dependent on a well-capitalised industry with two robust airlines. I mean, how do, how, does, how do the resorts in Port Douglas or the wineries or the museums in Hobart survive if the number of incoming flights um, are slashed and prices are hiked up. And of course, the gravity of that type of question has been um, increased tenfold in the urgent and desperate times we've seen the processes around the administration of Virgin. 
and we'll come to that later. Um, but at the moment, uh, we've got uh, companies such as Qantas involved in things like private health insurance, credit cards, wine delivery and wine clubs. Now, we've got no problem with uh, companies leveraging their brand or, or, or airlines leveraging their brand, but uh, this kind of luxury consumerization is a second order priority and this crisis has shown us that. Now, aviation's got to really attend to the baseline expectations of what aviation uh, and airlines need to do in our economy. So that's point number one, returning to the core. Point number two, um, the aviation workforce of the future shouldn't be forced into a Darwinist survival model. And we had Alan Joyce talking about survival of the fittest, and that just gives you an indication of the type of atmosphere that aviation is being conducted in at the moment. And we don't have an issue with uh, healthy market competition, uh, but you can't have healthy market competition if the framework, if the market itself is not healthy. Uh, and in aviation, there are two clear indications of that. One's obviously the present indication, COVID, means uh, the market's shut down. It's not effectively operating at the moment, but it wasn't just COVID. It's the fact that this industry is susceptible to this type of external shock. These external shocks are, in a sense, absolutely predictable. Uh, not uh, individually predictable, but the fact that external shocks will continue to hit us, it's a bit like us saying that, don't worry in Australia, you never have to worry about drought. We know drought's going to hit us, we just don't know when. We know external shocks are going to hit aviation. We just don't know when. And it's our responsibility to figure out what are the structures and what is the baseline that we need to ensure that we can resist those external shocks. But the second clear ind indication is evident in this industry well before the COVID shock. Um, and it's the fact that the competition is actually destructive. It, it's an industry that is literally cannibalizing itself. You know, especially since the Qantas grounding, but before the capacity of workers to collectively bargain um, and to increase their terms, enhance their terms and conditions and their job security has been actually eroded. Uh, we've got Qantas who proudly over the last 10 years has spoken about directly hired workers as a legacy workforce. Again, giving you the impression that aviation has moved into a, a dog eat dog uh, type of world. And we've got companies now and an industry now uh, that is marked by declining standards, precarity of employment and operation, uh, operations, aviation operations that are so marginal uh, and, and companies and workers that are in competition with each other, which means that this industry, which used to be uh, a prized industry full of prized occupations that people would be proud to enter for life, uh, is now a set of occupations and companies fighting over the scraps of spiteful and unchaperoned competition. Um, and, you know, that's uh, something that has to be dealt with and which COVID has exposed in all of its ugliness. We've seen proliferations and divisions right throughout aviation. An example is Jetstar. The recent Jetstar dispute, James, just very quickly, uh, I attended a meal room when the Jetstar workforce was voting on the enterprise agreement just recently. And in that room, workers were having to decide whether that enterprise agreement was in their best interest. The problem was it wasn't just one worker, one set of workers, a generic set of workers. They all had the same uniform on, but we had full-time workers, part-time workers, part-time workers on 30 hours, part-time workers on 20 hours, casual workers, labour hire workers, fixed term workers, seven categories of worker. So we're now in a position where this industry is not just um, company uh, aggressively uh, fighting company uh, in competition, in destructive competition. We now have worker pitted against worker. And that's not something that I think any Australian uh, would want. So, We'll come back to that question about uh, how that looks for workers in this industry, perhaps in some more detail in due course, James, except to say this is really topical. 
we've currently got a national argument about, for example, the value of the enterprise bargaining system. But this is not an argument that's about uh, marginal gripes about elongated approval processes for enterprise agreements. This is what enterprise bargaining has led us to in aviation. It's a system that's facilitating the aviation equivalent literally of the Hunger Games, and it's something we've got to address. And thirdly, James, really the question then arises is, what will it take to civilise this industry, to meet the national interest? And we say that one important part of that is that the public must take an ownership stake, if only for a temporary period. Both Qantas and Virgin are burning through cash week by week. Let me be clear about this. Virgin's under the hammer now. But Qantas too is burning cash. And if this crisis continues, it won't be too long before Qantas comes knocking on the federal government's door. And I want to be very clear, despite the fact that industrial times have been difficult between Qantas and its workforce recently, I want to be very clear. When Qantas does knock on the door, we'll support their call. Because this crisis has really spoke of, you know, sparked a fundamental question. It's really as fundamental as this. Do airlines even really belong on the stock market? Whether it's a pandemic, terrorism, volcanoes, civil unrest, this industry is prone to those crises. Um, aviation is probably better suited to a combination of private and patient and public capital in its ownership mix. That would mean uh, that we have an industry that is uh, more disciplined, is chaperoned, and has the public interest at its core and at its heart, uh, and not just uh, the profit incentives um, of fully privatised companies that have led to this competition position. So they're the three areas um, that I thought uh, worthy of a little bit of exploration, James, um, and back over to you. Uh, yeah, clearly some big questions both on the short term and the long term uh, uh, structure of the industry there. I guess I'll, I'll bring it back to the short term first uh, and the, you know, the questions of support, the prospects of uh, the need for further support. Uh, one of the things that uh, struck me when we were working through the issues and the, in trying to meet the government's preferred preference for a market lead solution uh, is that markets generally work best when there is certainty well, and one of the pieces of certainty they need is, is in this case is an, an understanding of when travel restrictions will be lifted. Now of course the uncertainty around health creates a bit of a conundrum there around when you know the promises and commitments government can make around that. So the question I, I was uh, wanting, to, wanting to open with is does that uncertainty and the challenges governments have mean that there is a really a very realistic chance we're going to need to see ongoing financial support for the aviation sector in Australia, particularly if we want to see two comp uh, viable competitive airlines. And if that's the case, does that need really need to be on the table now and being talked about publicly so that airlines or prospective owners of airlines can factor that into their, their planning? Margie, if I can throw that to you in the first instance to get your, your thoughts on that, that key question around is there you know, the, the likelihood or need for ongoing financial support? Well, look, to be frank with you, I think the whole industry is going to require a level of ongoing support. I don't see recovery in this state, this, um, this situation happening much between earlier than three or four years. It's going to be a difficult and impossible time. It's going to take governments to actually look at their full forward estimates and actually commit over a longer term period to give companies that level of certainty. I would say to you, though, I think the government has been incredibly responsive to the tourism industry in particular. Um, because we were already in a series of major conversations with government uh, during the bushfires, uh, that conversation naturally rolled over into COVID-19. And I think they have been incredibly sensitive to the needs of the industry. But it's important to understand that at this point in time, we're probably needing something like $9.6 billion a month and of the 660, nearly 700,000 direct employees in the industry, we may very well see over 400,000 of them directly affected by this problem. And that's 
you know, a, a shocking outcome across the board for the industry because we rely upon our people. And I would have to say all of our members who are the major players within the tourism industry are deeply and completely concerned about what is going to happen to those people because we're a people industry, you know, that's how we roll. Um, I think probably from an aviation specific perspective, certainly other countries around the world are very focused on what kind of aviation support they're going to put in place and how that will be managed. Countries like Singapore had already put their hand in their pocket four months ago to the tune of $150 million just for an aviation attraction fund before the reality of COVID became as obvious as it did. So beyond the domestic situation, there will be an issue here in terms of attracting a whole range of routes back into the country and other international carriers back into Australia. One of the things that happened quite early on was a number of countries chose to rationalise their routes and the number of flights they were flying into Australia and, of course, other countries. So that aviation attraction piece is going to be critical. And then you need to consider on the domestic scene, beyond those highly profitable routes and highly used use routes that Paul mentioned earlier, it will be about regional communities and it will be about the fact that the government, the, the whole country is joined by a web of aviation routes. And for those regional communities to sustain themselves, that aviation will be critical in the future. And I am sure the government is already looking at this issue around how they support the aviation industry in the short term. The only other thing I would say to you about this is what we're now seeing in a number of European countries is where governments have made decisions to support the industry. They've also added some criteria, if you like. Um, so in a number of European countries, if you're attracting the government support as an aviation carrier, you also have to now meet a whole range of sustainability criteria uh, uh, to be eligible for the cash. So there are some interesting changes going on. I think it's important to understand though that the aviation characters, uh, carriers rather that are Australia's carriers are core to the industry and I think are doing the very best they can to support the future of the industry and the people who work for them. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Paul, uh, do you want to add your thoughts to that, including, I guess, if you, you know, drawing your time as a state government minister, thinking about, well, what's, what's the role of state governments in this? We often see aviation predominantly through a federal lens, but obviously, you know, states like Queensland and WA, that's not necessarily always the case. Well, a couple of things I want to say. One relates to the case for government intervention, and I'll deal with the federal government issues first, then indeed tourism, and then I suppose if you, uh, to mention uh, uh, at a state level. Uh, in, in relation to the federal government and their role, and I acknowledge, as Margie said, uh, strong support for the tourism sector, and it's doing it very, very tough. But there seems to be some sort of blind spot when it comes to their role in, uh, in, uh, in the aviation sector. Now, Qantas is as good as an airline as it is, and it is one of the best in the world, because Virgin is as good as it is. They both keep each other honest in passenger service, in fares, and in quality. And that is a, a classic reason why the small operator who's in tourism in country Queensland, who has to add in the airfares to the, to the thought processes of anyone who's going there, cares about having competition. We know there's precedent. Uh, throughout uh, the world, France, Germany, UK, United States, Singapore, New Zealand. And in fact, New Zealand's interesting because this is the second time that Air New Zealand has been supported. Uh, ANSET almost took Air New Zealand with it when ANSET went broke. The New Zealand government put $885 million into Air New Zealand and took an 80% equity ownership in the airline and gradually sold it down. So there are various models that one can have a look at for, uh, for uh, uh, intervention by a federal government that does not involve it writing blank checks. Um, can I say to you, it's always easy to go to a treasurer to act for, ask for a capital sum than to ask for recurrent money. Uh, and I would rather see them get on their feet uh, in Virgin and then be viable uh, in the market than seeing someone writing checks forever. So I think that's an important aspect. Uh, in relation to tourism, uh, let's not just be negative about it all. There's a lot of really positive opportunities. First of all, in a trans-Tasman trans bubble, there'll be enormous destinations in Australia that people will have to go to. But if you look in Queensland, uh, the busiest of, in the top 20 airports in Australia 
Brisbane is three, Gold Coast is six, Cairns is seven, Townsville 11, Sunshine Coast 14, Mackay 15, Rockhampton 17. Victoria, Western Australia and South Australia, or sorry, Western Australia has one. The other two states have none in that top 20. So it really matters to Queensland when it comes to aviation and the role that it plays in providing those, uh, in providing those services. The other thing that I think will be really interesting in two ways um, for tourism, our cruise ship industry clearly has major issues uh, in perception that will take a long time to overcome. There are many people in Australia who go in around Australia cruises because their insurance, if they're elderly, can cover them for that. They may not, in fact, go on cruise ships for a long time now, and they will switch not to overseas trips. They'll switch to other destinations in Australia. So that's an opportunity uh, for the Australian aviation sector. And secondly, and it's terribly tragic to say this, but it is a fact of life, that every time that someone looks at what happens in, in, in terrible unrest overseas, uh, and if they're living in an overseas country and they say what's happening in the United States or what's happening elsewhere, or well, they see the Olympics in Australia being success successful or the Commonwealth Games, they see this as a key safe tourism destination. So there's a, a whole lot of marketing that government, federal and state have to do to actually internally and then after we open up to do that. Finally, what's the role of the state? Very quickly, that intrastate travel is significant. The Milk Runs, the Charles, the Cunnamulla, Mount Isa, Emerald, all of those sorts of places are key, key airports. States regulate them, states subsidise them, or indeed Queensland does, some states don't. Uh, and they also often control land use around, around non-federal airports. So there's a real role. I'll give you one example before I finish. Uh, Horn Island Airport, the gateway to, Thirst, to, to the Torres Strait, runway wasn't long enough, Q400s couldn't go and they're fully laden. Federal and state money went in to extend that runway. What does that do? You can, you can put more people in the plane. What does that do? Reduce the passenger seat kilometre cost of those flights. Government needs to be more creative in looking at how it can improve the economics of the industry on an infrastructure spend basis as well. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Michael, um, in getting your thoughts on the uh, on the the need for ongoing sustained support as we as we come on the road out, as the Prime Minister's called it, I've also got a question here from uh, the audience, and I encourage others to send them through. That's asking around uh, also what the advantages might be uh, of private equity being a new owner of Virgin Australia. I guess, Michael, that's something you had touched on. So, if you can e expand on your thoughts on. On, on that uh, in the context of given that's something that might very well be on the cards in the current administration as well as yeah the, the question of ongoing support for for the industry yeah well look I, I think that um, if, if, uh, if I could start from the initial question which was around um, the certainty that's uh, that seems to be lacking at the moment uh, part of that certainty is hard to give as you've said James in relation to the uh, in relation to COVID uh, but certainty becomes easier to, uh, uh, to put in place and to implement um, the further you zoom out, the further you zoom away. Um, and I think that um, uh, what is important to remember in aviation from now on, um, as if we haven't had enough reminders in the past, is that it's first hit and most susceptible um, uh, when we have external shocks. And the ripple effects, as Margie and Paul have spoken about, uh, are enormous uh, and they're unpredictable. And in these current circumstances, um, we could still see, unfortunately for our community, the worst to come. Um, what uh, government has shown uh, through this crisis, um, sometimes acting um, in, in ways that the community would, would suggest is brilliant and unsurprising, sometimes acting in, in ways where the community wonders what, what they are doing. What they have shown, though, is that uh, there is the capacity of government to, to jump in and to make a difference. And in aviation right now, we think about a, a, a massive second airline under administration. Um, we think about the uncertainty around uh, opening borders again. Um, we think about uh, what would be the ramifications of not being able to at least get the second airline uh, off the ground. There's, a, there's, there's, there's quite an obvious role for the federal government to play because the federal government 
is the is the body that holds the levers, in a sense, the supply levers in terms of our borders, um, in terms of uh, wrangling our new national cabinet. Um, and um, it makes perfect sense um, in the short term for them to take a very direct interest also in ensuring that uh, those airlines, which in Virgin's case has taken you know, 20 years to really establish itself, um, don't need to re-establish themselves or another entity doesn't need to re-establish themselves. Put themselves in the frame uh, right now. They can control supply and they will take, um, uh, they will let that supply come in as health advice allows. And um, they can then calibrate the assistance. Um, they, they are best placed to do that. So it's not even a case of wishful thinking here. It's a case of who is best placed to be able to see the industry through the current crisis. And clearly, when you're in control of those um, complementary policy levers, then it is the federal government that has a key role to play. Um, uh, going to the question of the long term, though, it, it does come down, we think, to looking seriously at um, uh, ensuring that we don't have to have a situation where ad hoc cap in hand approaches need to be made every time there is an external stressor because we need aviation we know the stresses that airlines are under and in, in the normal course of events and we know we now have a long history over the last 40 50 60 years of aviation being hit up by external shocks so as i said earlier we know external shocks will come what is it that we can put in place on a permanent basis in terms of perhaps it's Margie's um, pointing to the suggestions of tying in certain standards to, um, uh, to levels of assistance, et cetera, as some countries have done. But what is the permanent state of affairs that can add permanent stability and act as a shock absorber um, so that we can have the confidence into the future? Because that actually will help competition. It'll allow uh, aviation companies to make uh, longer term investment decisions about regions, which is critical, and we've heard about today. Um, it'll allow them to make longer term decisions about the security um, of their job, uh, jobs and their workforce, allow them to put in place more permanent positions as we used to have um, in the past in aviation. So I think in the, immediately, in the immediate sense, supply and um, uh, policy levers make uh, the federal government um, an, a logical and urgent option. Uh, for, um, in a sense, emergency assistance. And then now some really serious thought as to what a permanent shock absorber would look like and what conditions could attach to that to give companies into the future the investment confidence to be able to build the industry uh, into something better than it is now. Uh, Margie, I guess there's, there's two things there that um, uh, you, you touched upon in your earlier remarks. Um, one of those is if we can get the the, the federal government can get the framework right, like Michael described, there still will be then that question of the consumer confidence side of things, which, which you touched on. And, I'm, I, and, and using the, the notion that people will feel safer in their car than in their, uh, uh, than, than on a bus and then, than in a train. Um, how much of the consumer confidence is driven by, so two questions on that. One is how much of the consumer confidence is driven by an uncertainty around whether they will even be able to travel. And so therefore, if they're thinking ahead and making plans, it's like, well, there's no point, you know, spending too much time researching on the internet if I just don't even think I'm realistically going to be able to fly versus direct concerns around what uh, the level of safety might and, and health risk might be in that mode of transport. And I guess then following on from that, what can we, you know, do from a policy point of, uh, of you around addressing that? Okay, so I think there's probably a couple of things to do with the marketplace. The short term issue is the fear of COVID and what it will mean if they get back on public transport or on an aeroplane. And there is a job of work to do there to make sure that they can get the information they need to feel confident. Um, I think probably one of the issues that the aviation industry has absorbed particularly well 
is that this is not a situation you should just leave to government. Industry needs to own the solution. So that's why it's been working very hard, both domestically and, and the international, to work with government and take to um, the respective federal governments in Australia and New Zealand, for example, uh, a, a strategy and a plan that's considered and worked through by both industry and government. And I think if there's um, perhaps a, a great outcome from a terrible situation, it is that cooperative work that's now going ahead, which I think is, is really valuable. I think from a, a more specific sense in the confidence factor, I think Paul mentioned earlier that um, two of the routes here in Australia are in the top 10 in the world in terms of both numbers and profitability, and that's Sydney, Melbourne, Melbourne, Sydney, and Sydney, Brisbane, Brisbane, Sydney. Um, now, a lot of these are actually business flights. You know, it's essentially lots of business people traveling backwards and forwards or people simply doing business, if you like. One of the things that we're now seeing is that the big sleeper in this conversation is how quickly is that business travel going to bounce back? And will it, in fact, bounce back? Because we've all been taking part in possibly one of the world's largest global social experiments. And it's clear that the nature of the workforce is going to change pretty dramatically and how we work together and how we communicate is going to change really dramatically. Now, if that is the case, and as we're hearing many large companies who previously would have had, you know, 15, $20 million annual business budgets are not putting that, that money into um, travel, business travel. They're sort of saying, no, nah, uh, not worth uh, the difficulties that might be associated. And after all, Zoom seems to be working very well. So in terms of the longer term um, impacts on the industry, that's going to be a major factor. I do think the other part of this that people aren't yet paying a great deal of attention to, because it's probably the next phase of the conversation, is some of these changes are not temporary. They're not temporary. The public is going to change dramatically in terms of how they want to travel, how safe they will feel, whether they want to and where they will go. Uh, and we're still trying to get a handle on what that changed environment looks like. So. Young people, for example, are always the last to stop traveling and the first to start again. Will we see that this time? We don't quite know. We're seeing a lot of bookings in that space. Uh, so there is a level of confidence and there is a willingness to dream and to plan. Um, we're seeing lots of people plus 55 who might have taken off to Italy for a month thinking, oh, well, okay, I can spend some money here in Australia or New Zealand and I'll find somewhere glamorous to go. But it's the group in between it's the mums and the dads and um, the people we all are um, deciding whether they're going to travel or whether they're just not going to spend that money. Uh, and do they feel confident enough? Have they in fact got enough leave to go away? And have they materially changed the way they think about traveling period? And I think these imponderables are going to have to be part of any future planning for the aviation industry. And I know the big companies, the you know, the ones who have been fabulous, iconic Australian aviation companies like Qantas and Virgin um, would all be looking at these issues into the future and trying to understand how the travelling public, whether they be business or leisure travellers and ultimately inbound, might change. And if I could just pop back to Michael's, one of Michael's points about, um, it was Michael, uh, talking about the way, or it might have been Paul, I apologise, um, talking about how people view Australia because of the way the disease has actually been managed here. And do we somehow pick up, uh, yes, it was Paul, uh, pick up a little extra because people view us as a very safe place to come. And that will manifest itself in way beyond just the leisure tourism industry into the education sectors, into our agricultural export centre sectors, all sorts of things. So I think really when we're talking about what the shape of the industry is going to look like in the future, I'm not certain we know enough at the moment to be making those decisions. Okay. Uh, so if uh, we push it out a bit further then, um, uh, look at, looking at the longer term, which is certainly one of the things that we wanted to address in the, in the paper and Michael's touched on it. Uh, and we've also got some questions about the regional aviation angle. So I'll direct this to Paul. What, what, Paul, what do you think are some of the policies we need to be thinking about to, to get a more sustainable model particularly one that uh, works for regional Australians and not just the, you know, the, the triangle, the Brisbane, Melbourne City triangle that, that uh, you mentioned earlier. Well, for every airport that someone lands at, someone's got to take off from and vice versa. So in a state like the one that I'm from, there are so many regional airports that this is significant for. And so uh, this is why a comprehensive policy is a really significant thing Margie touched on this point, 
that aviation and people who fly in aeroplanes are not one big group. There are people who fly business class for business. There are people who fly business class for pleasure. There are people who fly for business, economy class. There are people who are leisure, leisure travellers and highly price sensitive. There are people who travel at different times of the year to different places. There are people who have to do it from employment or for health treatment reasons and the like. Each of them have different needs and markets that are important. And that's why I'm very worried with what, happened, with what will come out of the Virgin issue at the moment, that we need to have competition in all of those areas. It will not help if all that we see is a budget airline come out of it. And indeed, uh, you know, people might be sitting there saying, oh, well, you know, of course, Michael, I'd say he wants someone, the government to invest in, uh, you know, in, in, in Virgin and the like. Well, I'll just say this. Uh, everything is about a risk return e uh, equation. This will be the third time, um, you know, that, that we will have an airline that will go broke in Australia. What do you think someone who might invest in a new Virgin will be expecting for a turn on their capital if they do it without a sensible policy framework? And if there's no sensible policy framework, who will be there actually able to do it? Either someone who dices it and slices it or indeed, ultimately, an international competitor, probably from the Middle East or China, and that will not be in Qantas's best interests or anyone else's. So I think we have to be very, very careful there. But in terms of regions, I do think one of the role, roles that governments, federal and state, will need to play is really looking at how we market and support uh, destination tourism. Uh, it requires, and, 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 and we do it pretty well, but how do we understand all those sub-segments? How can we support people more to go to those destinations and see the joy and enjoyment of that of traveling, uh, of traveling there? Uh, many of our regional airports, of course, have strong business functions as well. You look at an airport like Gladstone, a lot of people go there for work as well. I think it's really significant to, uh, to uh, make sure that we've, uh, uh, we analyze that as well. So look, what we need to do in our policy framework is to sit down and say, we're not just looking at airlines, we're looking at airports, we're looking at things that service airports, and we're looking at land around airports, and we're looking about at industries that are reliant on it. One of the great things we'll have about Western Sydney, and one of the advantages that Brisbane has, is all this land around it. What are we talking about in regional airports? Businesses they facilitate, and tourism in particular, I think it's a really significant thing. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add on the, on the regional element of, of this challenge and, um, and ensuring a sustainable industry for regional Australians? Well, I think, I think it, it, through the prism of Virgin at the moment, I think what Paul has said is absolutely critical. I mean, um, the, uh, if, if an airline um, comes uh, uh, back up from the Virgin process, that's great. But Paul's hit the nail on the head. It's the character of the operation. It's the footprint of the operation that is also critical. Because let's face it, um, uh, Qantas has turned into a, uh, uh, a very fierce uh, competitor. Good luck, good luck to it. Um, but if the footprint is too anemic, um, if what comes out of Virgin is too anemic, it will be susceptible to economic pressure from Qantas and it won't have the footprint and it won't have the capacity um, to be able to grow. We've seen lots of small airlines who, um, who exist in Australia, but by the skin of their teeth. And I'm reminded by um, my colleague, Linda White, um, uh, in the chat that it's actually, um, Paul, I think we're up to airline number four. Uh, she's pointed out Compass 1 and 2, Anset and Impulse. Um, and there comes a point, doesn't there, where a government, it, rather than... Uh, uh, us as a community banging our head against the proverbial brick wall and um, doing that thing that Einstein said we shouldn't do, just repeating what, what we know is wrong, um, uh, we should actually take uh, a different approach. And the regional economy is absolutely uh, critical and um, virgin in the regional economy because of where it's grown, because of where it's based is critical as well. And let's not underplay this just in finishing, James, talk about regional economies. Let's also talk about Australia. I think it was Margie that said we are all connected by um, uh, this web of aviation. It is good, it is healthy to have the operation of a major um, aviation player 
uh, somewhere other than Brisbane, uh, other than Sydney or Melbourne. Now, there'll be those who say, well, look, uh, from a logistical point of view, uh, it doesn't make as much sense. But it does make sense at the moment because that's where it's based. It's 20 years. It's supporting a massive regional economy in Queensland. Um, we've got a virgin operation that in the financial year 16 contributed 3.4 billion to our economy, 75,000 in indirect uh, uh, jobs and direct jobs, uh, 15,600 full-time equivalent jobs. You know, this is a moment in time for us and I absolutely take Margie's point about the uncertainty about how aviation will look into the future. And it's that uncertainty envelope that needs to be fixed. We need to have a safety net there. As we're putting the safety net in place though, let's not fall into the trap once again of making it ad hoc. Let's start thinking about what the medium to long-term building blocks are for that shock absorber of sustainability, of public, uh, if not ownership, public ownership of aviation in conjunction with private capital so that we can uh, make sure that the community, the Australian community, all of it is uh, properly catered for in, in our aviation sector. James, can I, James, can I just make one more point that I, uh, about regional aviation? Virgin uh, has been very successful in its arrangements with Alliance in terms of the on carriage of, of uh, uh, customers. And you, you, you note in your report that a number of people are not like those of us lucky enough to live in capital cities who can have, have a significant choice of airlines straight out of a, a international carriage. There are many people in Australia who do not have that level of choice. And we know that international travel is sticky. So if you come in with one airline, you want to stay with that airline. And so that will actually also lead, lead to lack of competition in international onbound journeys if we don't have that addressed. So uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that diversity in that regional carriage, even if not by the core airline, but by those who have a relationship with it is critical as well. Um, Margie, the, the shock absorbers that Michael was describing uh, are there any that come to mind from your end that in terms of would, would make it easier for your members to achieve a more sustainable, resilient kind of um, uh, way of operating so that they can weather these shocks more effectively? What, yeah, what are some of the sorts of building blocks you think would help? And we've got one question that this may or, no, may or may not be relevant. It's certainly not something we consider much in the report is do we need to revisit the question of majority Australian ownership? of the Australian carriers. So I'll, I'll tack that one at the end as well for all of you too. Um, look, I, I do think that in terms of so-called shock absorber, um, look, with all respect, uh, respect, COVID-19 is a completely different species of shock. This is, you know, unprecedented, and I hate that word because everybody's been using it now for months, but that is the case. And it's not unique to Australia. I mean, the aviation industry in every other country in the world is suffering the same problems. Um, I have a fortnightly catch up with my colleagues in America and Canada, and they are suffering and asking exactly the same questions in this space. But I am hesitant to suggest to you what the, the uh, future buffers might be in this, because I don't think we know enough about what that world is going to look like. I genuinely think from an international travel point of view, it's going to be several years before we fully recover. And as part of that process, who can we attract back in terms of routes and therefore the flow onto agriculture and manufacturing and others? Well, we're not quite certain what countries we're going to be able to engage with. Um, so for me, I think it's a case of survival at the moment. Um, the industry is very much focused on how it gets from here to the middle of next year and the, we're capable of operating. Um, I think the government is open to a conversation about this, but I think we need to know a lot more about what will happen with borders, what will happen with people's intentions and desire to fly and the things that might change their mind and what those different demographics now look like. And this is a huge issue for every part of the industry to grapple with. It's, it's not as simple as saying, well, there might be a shock that impacts on our bottom line. It's much more than that. Um, and I think part of this will also be um, a coming together around 
for the whole range of Australian companies. He's mentioned Rex, you know, I mean, that's a critical part of the regional delivery process here in Australia. And I think at a, at a level, public level, there is a genuine level of affection for all of the Australian based airlines. But I do think that the public themselves will determine a lot of this. It's fine to talk about supply, but if there ain't no demand, we're not going to see the sorts of indicators we need to make decisions in the longer term for some time. Paul, you got any uh, final remarks, including on the question of uh, majority Australian ownership? I'm pretty you know, ambivalent about whether it's majority Australian ownership or not. I don't think that's the key issue, but I'll make a couple of uh, bullet point observations. The first of all is this. If we actually want to have more Australian investment in our industrial sector, maybe we should actually be serious about supporting the superannuation of Australian workers better. And instead of these, this, this group of individuals, aided and abetted by the Grattan Institute, who want to make a tax on how much money we are putting into national superannuation, the biggest thing that has converted Australia from a net uh, poor savings country to an international investor has been the pool of funds in, in, in national superannuation. So I'd actually rather see a greater source of Australian funds that actually had the choice to invest rather than be um, uh, rather than be made to invest. And I certainly don't like government mandating things, and I don't like government owning things like in the aviation sector in the long term. Having said that, what do we now know? The case for government in intervention is stronger. We now know that strategic fuel reserves we will have to look at them completely differently. We now know strategic medical manufacturing, drugs, pharmaceuticals, and those sort of things. We have to look at them differently. So we now need to say in this uncertain world, and it's not just COVID-19, you've, you've got to look at China and the United States and their fights, um, Russian de cyber destabilization, what must we have in terms of internal resilience and insurance policies? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see us uh, bulking up a bit uh, and uh, that's where the role of government is, and it doesn't necessarily have to own it, but it should facilitate it. Uh, Michael, uh, any final remarks from you on, I guess it's the economic sovereignty element that uh, Paul was really touching on there. Do you have any, any quick final remarks before we need to wrap things up? Yeah, look, thanks. Thanks, James. Um, uh, thanks, Paul and Margie. Look, I, I think the overarching uh, point here is that we do need to keep open minds. I think that... Um, it is arguable, um, I think, with, with some strength uh, to say that in recent times, uh, there's been a mindset against, in Australia, um, uh, public um, stakes in aviation. Uh, and uh, I think that in very many respects, um, uh, that does see us as an outlier as against some of those international um, hubs that are either competition for us or we are incredibly reliant on as we try and ma uh, make the bridge back into the global economy. And um, we talk about often in competition, um, wanting to ensure that there's, um, uh, to the extent possible, a level playing field, that everyone's playing by the same rules. And um, it's one thing to say that in Australia, um, but we need to have our eye towards the rest of the world as well. And if we've got uh, aviation companies that are expected to compete against um, companies uh, in hubs near us and hubs that we rely on and hubs that compete with us uh, that are being supported significantly by their uh, governments, uh, then that's not a level playing field. And I think that's something we should take into account. And just back to the final point, James, that um, we are in uncertain times. Everyone said it today. Um, uh, we do need a stabiliser uh, for the immediate term. We need, in our view, a shock absorber for the a shock absorber for the medium to long term. And one logical way to get that is through patient public capital, rather than uh, or in addition to um, impatient private capital that is really seeking ultimately and must seek in accordance with its mandate um, the quickest uh, uh, route to profit. I think if we acknowledge that all uh, uh, openly with each other, um, that's a very good start for um, the conversation. So thanks. Thanks, Michael. And, and thank you, Paul and Margie, for, uh, for taking some time out to uh, speak with us all today. Look, it's been really enriched our 
uh, our work and consideration of these issues. So thank you, thank you uh, all three of you for your time today. Thank you everyone else for, for tuning in and um, your interest in this important discussion. And uh, we hope uh, you enjoy the report and add some value to, to your own contributions to this debate. Uh, thanks. Thanks.